This has uh, been uh, very insightful. Your testimony uh, is very insightful. Uh, Dr. Burrell, I, I was interested in one of the things you said that 20 percent <laughs> of the medication <laughs> that people are abusing are coming from pres for, for medical reasons, that have been prescribed for medical reasons. And uh, one of the things we've been focusing on, of course, is, you know, I'm a physician. I was a cardiovascular surgeon before, is prescribing, you know, monitoring prescribing habits. But if 80 percent is coming from somewhere else, where is it coming from? 70, 80 percent, whatever it is. You, 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 I think you said 80 percent. Yes, so it's 80 percent, of which um, 70 percent is coming from family and friends. Okay, that's what I figured. And it's, so it's, it's not their particular medical use, but at the, at the end of the day, it's been prescribed for a medical use from, for someone. Okay, and that's where maybe, you know, drop boxes and other uh, vo initially voluntary return, return uh, policies uh, potentially could be helpful because, uh, yeah, there's, there is, there are, last year you probably know there were more prescription, enough prescriptions written that every person in the United States of America could have gotten a bottle of, of, of narcotic pain medicine. And uh, Medicare Part D just came out and said that recently that the number one prescribed medicine under Medicare Part D, and so this goes across age, ages, right? Mm -hmm. It was Vicodin. Mm -hmm. And so um, the prescribing, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, the, in the prescribing programs and trying to monitor, you know, physician prescribing. And as part of that, education is, of course, important. And that's where uh, uh, it's, it's not only for the people that are about using it, but it's the people that are being trained to take care of patients as, as we speak in health, in, in medical schools and, and uh, other areas. Um, so that, that's going to be very important. Uh, Dr. Adams, in your testimony, you say an aggressive educational strategy beginning with childhood. Um, can, you, can you kind of expand a little bit on that, what, you, what your thoughts were on that? Well, thank you for the opportunity. And for those of you who don't know, Congressman Bouchon married up. He married an anesthesiologist. <laughs> um, but, but, but as far as that... <laughs> that is a true statement. <laughs> the, the, the aggressive educational lamp campaign. Quick story. I was in Scott County um, just a few weeks ago meeting with a 23-year-old individual who had HIV. He was in our clinic. And I said, how did you get started? He said, I had an injury um, in, as a freshman in high school, knee injury playing football. The doc prescribed me Vicodin. I kind of liked how it made me feel, so I took all the Vicodin he gave me, took some more, ran out. He said it was easy to get in the community, got more Vicodin. Finally, that wasn't doing the job. Switched to OxyContin until so that wasn't doing the job. Then I started injecting. And then he switched over to heroin, and now he's a 23-year-old HIV addict. We've got to get to these people earlier. And when you talk about an aggressive strategy, it starts with recognition. We need an educational campaign to help students rec understand that, that this is a problem. I used to sneak to, a, to my friend's house when I was in high school and have a beer. They sneak to their friend's house and pop a pill. And unfortunately, one out of 15 people who divert a pill will ultimately go on to heroin use. One out of 15 of my friends who popped a beard didn't go on to get HIV. So that we, we need to, to increase the recognition of the problem. We need resilience and, and anti-bullying campaigns so that kids are okay saying, no, I'm not going to take a random pill out of, that, out of that bowl. We need appropriate age level education. And I was meeting with people from the state just yesterday who showed us their data. And the interventions in each age group are different. Uh, what, what works for a fifth grader doesn't work for a sixth grader, doesn't work for an eighth grader. There's got to be age-appropriate education and intervention. There's got to be adult and peer outlets. So, hey, if someone's doing something wrong, I know who to go to. I know who to tell. And then finally, to your point, we need take-back programs. 62% of teenagers who use say the number one reason they use is because it's easy to get the medications from my parents' cabinet. It's right there. It's easier to get a pill than what it was for me to get a beer. And you can hide it and you can walk away with it. And so all that needs to be part of the, of the campaign, and it needs to start in middle school, in elementary school. Did you have a... Can, can, can I, I got one other question I want to ask you about uh, naltrexone, because I've given that to patients mm -hmm. in a hospital setting. And Mr. Springer, maybe you can comment on that. And I think not only the availability, but the appropriate uh, training for people, you know, for law enforcement for, uh, people or EMTs about uh, the fact that, like somebody pointed out, it's not, a, it's not a silver bullet here. There's also downsides to giving patients uh, Narcan or naltrexone. Can you comment on that? About the, what what type of educational stuff is also? I mean, I think were you one of the ones that were commenting on naltrexone? Yeah. Uh, or, or maybe Dr. Burrell could right. answer that. 
Maybe I can just I can yeah. start. I mean, and certainly, I'll tell you, when I went to... Uh, and I'm out of time, so can you... Oh, won't we just what do this? Why don't you just... Why not we... Uh, you want Dr. Burrell to answer? That'd be fine. So as part of our um, Narcan program, so we've handed out in Massachusetts since 2007 over 35,000 doses of Narcan, and part of that includes, um, to your point about education, so the individuals who are handing out the Narcan to both bystanders and law enforcement, there's a training that goes along with it, and they are also trained on rescue breaths and the importance of it being short acting and to call 911 at the same time. And we've re recorded over 5,000 reversals with that. Yeah. So the educational component is directly linked when we hand out our doses. Yeah, I think that's important because in my opinion, if, you, if, a, if someone has to give someone Narcan, they should also be calling 911. And those people probably should be transported to a medical facility. Yeah. Thank you. Are you back? Yeah, we'll, we'll want your other thoughts on it too. We've also heard some people saying then some people have a false sense of security thinking, oh, there's Narcan around. I can go ahead and take the risk.